Lecture 4.3, Addition of Two Waves and the Phenomenon of Beats. As a review, remember that if we have a de Broglie wave that is a uh, harmonic wave uh, that has a wave number k and uh, angular velocity omega, we can find the momentum and the energy of the, of the particle. So the momentum is h bar times k, and the energy is h bar times omega. And we found that the general expressions for the phase velocity is uh, omega over k, and the general expression for the group velocity is d omega dk. Okay, so wave packets uh, can be thought of as being constructed from a superposition of two or more traveling waves. In this lecture, we will look at the uh, phenomenon of beats, which is what happens when you add two uh, traveling waves together. In the next lecture, we'll look at Fourier series when you add uh, many, many traveling waves. You can get more, um, uh, more complex um, uh, wave packets. All right, so let's consider adding two waves. The waves are going to have the same amplitudes, A, but different wave numbers k. So wave one will have wave number k, k1, and wave two will have wave number k2. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. We're gonna add our two waves together. Uh, this is a homework problem that you can show uh, just using trig identities that if you add these two sine functions, you can write them as the product of a sine and a cosine term. The sine term here uh, is, uh, can be thought of as like the high frequency carrier component. So the uh, wave number uh, of that sine wave is the, the mean of the two wave numbers of the individual wave. So one half K1 plus K2. So this will give, uh, so this term gives a relatively high frequency sine wave. This term uh, is since you're since you're subtracting or taking the difference between the two wave numbers, uh, the result is going to have a wave number that's less than either k1 or k2, and that will correspond to a longer period or a, a lower frequency. So, because this cosine term is multiplied by the sine term, we're taking a high frequency. Um, carrier wave and multiplying it by this lower frequency modulating cosine term. And when you do that, when you take this function and you multiply it by that function, you get something that looks like this. So you get that um, uh, the amplitude of this carrier wave is modulated by this lower frequency component. So here are a few examples. If you take sine of t and add it to sine of 1.05 t. So the second term has a slightly higher frequency by 5% compared to the first one. When you add these two waves together, we see that you get uh, this beat phenomenon where the beats have a very low frequency. The, the wavelength there is very long. If the two sine waves differ by, by 10% instead of 5%, so there's a bigger difference in their, in their frequencies than the beats are going to have a, have a slightly shorter wavelength, so so you get more beats in the same amount of time. And then if you increase it to a 20% difference between the two sine waves, you get lots of little uh, beats with a shorter shorter period. So um, if you if you imagine now um, a traveling wave that has both a, a temporal and a spatial variation, uh, we can think about you can ask, we can ask the question about whether the waves beat in either time or space. So if the, the two waves have differing uh, wave numbers that are, that are close to the same but just slightly off, then the, the waves will beat in space. If the waves have slightly different uh, angular frequencies, then the waves will beat in time. And if the waves have slightly different wave numbers and angular frequencies, the wave would beat in both space and time. So we'll look at some examples. Okay, 
So here's an example uh, where, let's see here, uh, we have two waves. They're going to have the same angular frequency, so they both have an omega value of one radian per second. Uh, but the second wave has a slightly higher spatial frequency component. So K2 is 1.1, K1 is 1. Um, and so if we add these two together and then we animate it, we can see that there's like this high frequency component is traveling kind of to the right, but the uh, modulating envelope is just kind of stationary in space. So we can calculate um, the beat frequencies in both time and space. So the beat wave number for the spatial component is going to be k1 minus k2. So that's going to be 1.1 um, minus 1 is going to be just 0.1 radians per meter. Um, the, 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 way, the corresponding wavelength is going to be 2 pi over that wave number. So um, if you take 2 pi divided by 0.1, you get 63 meters in this case. So the wavelength is going to be uh, yeah, 63 meters. The carrier uh, wave number uh, is, like that's that higher frequency component where it's the average of K1 and K2. So we take one, so the, the average of one and 1.1 is just 1.05. If you figure out the corresponding wavelength, that's gonna be 5.98 meters. So um, almost like 10 times, more than 10 times smaller than what the, the beat wavelength is. And so that carrier wavelength corresponds to uh, the wavelength of this high frequency component um, of the wave. Okay, we can do the same thing in for the uh, temporal part. So the beat frequency for uh, the temporal part, we just uh, take the difference between the angular frequencies since they're both one, you get a zero here. And the period, the temporal period of those beats is one over zero, it's just gonna be infinite. So it's not, it's not actually beating, it's just steady. Uh, the carrier uh, frequency is gonna be just the average of omega one and omega two, so that's obviously just gonna be one radians per second. And the period, corresponding period is, uh, uh, 2 pi over 1, which is just 2 pi, or 6.28 seconds. So what do those correspond to? Well, so it's easy to label what the beat wavelength is on this diagram. It's simply the distance from one wave group to the next wave group, so this distance right here. And similarly, the carrier wavelength is just the, um, the wavelength of that higher frequency uh, carrier wave, like right there. It's a little bit harder to visualize what the temporal part is, you actually have to put the thing in motion to kind of understand um, that. So again, we found that the beat period is infinity and the carrier period is 6.28 seconds. So what does that mean? Um, it means if you were like to go and say, look at the very end of this wave and just, um, you're just, you're just measuring the height of the wave at a particular particular point. So imagine you're floating out in the ocean and you're just like bobbing up and down as the waves come past, come past you at a particular point. The carrier period is telling you the time between successive um, peaks to come past you. The period of the temporal beats is telling you how long you have to wait for the amplitude at that point to change. But as you can see, because the, the envelope is not moving in space, uh, it would take an infinite amount of time, right? Because, uh, because each one of these wave packets is just stationary and they're not moving past you. So let's actually animate that and, and try to look at that. So again, you're standing right here and you can see that that amplitude isn't changing. And that's why the, um, the period, the beat period is in infinite because that it's not changing. There is no oscillation in the amplitude. The 
Okay, let's calculate the phase velocity and the group velocity for our wave packet. So our wave function, our de Broglie wave, is going to be just the sum of these two sine waves, where we have parameters k1 and k2, omega1 and omega2. And in general, the, the amplitudes uh, could also be different, a1 and a2. So remember, the phase velocity was defined as omega over k. But we've got two k values and two omega values, so which one do you use? Um, the, you can show that the thing that makes sense is to simply take the average of each value. So what does that mean? Uh, imagine that you're surfing on the wave, so you're slightly down from the peak of the wave and you're kind of moving to the right. You want to, the phase velocity is going to be the speed of that point that is moving to the right um, where you're maintaining that constant phase. You're, you're, you're always just down from the, the crest of the wave. So remember that the group velocity is d omega dk, but unfortunately we don't have a continuous function that tells us what omega is as a function of k. We only have two waves, right? We've got this wave and we have this one. So the thing that makes sense uh, it turns out to be uh, the average group velocity for this pair of waves. So instead of using a derivative, we're just going to take a difference. So we're going to take omega 1 minus omega 2 over k1 minus k2. It turns out that this expression tells you the velocity of the, of the wave packet itself. So now instead of surfing the wave and moving um, at a constant phase, we're now just looking at the envelope of the wave packet and seeing the speed of that envelope. Okay, so let's look at the example that we had before. So um, in the example, remember omega 1 equaled omega 2 and k2 was 10% uh, larger than k1. So the phase velocity is going to be omega 1 plus omega 2 over k1 plus k2. So uh, that's going to be 1 plus 1 is 2 and 1 plus 1.1 is going to be 2.1, so you take that and you get, uh, so you divide that out and you get that the phase velocity is 0.95 meters per second. The group velocity is, well, since uh, omega 1 equals omega 2, the numerator is just going to be 0, so the group velocity is going to be 0. So let's, uh, let's animate that and see if that makes sense. So we can see that the the these packets are stationary, which makes which corresponds to having a zero uh, group velocity, but these uh, high frequency carrier components are actually moving through uh, those wave packets, and that's that uh, 0.95 meters per second that we calculated. All right, let's now change the parameters a little bit. Let's suppose that um, omega 2 is now 30% greater than omega 1 and see how that affects the dynamics. So the phase velocity, omega 1 plus omega 2, is going to be 1 plus 1.3 or 2.3. K1 plus K2 is still 2.1. So we now have a phase velocity that's greater than 1, so 1.1 meters per second. And now we have a non-zero group velocity Omega 1 minus omega 2 is going to be, uh, well, it's going to be negative 0.3. K1 minus K2 is going to be negative 0.1. The, the negatives cancel. And we get that the group velocity is 3 meters per second. So in this case, the group velocity is larger than the phase velocity. So notice now that these wave packets are the wave packet is actually moving faster than the carrier wave itself. Here, let's try that again. So, so the wave, the, the carrier wave is moving to the right, but the wave packets are moving even faster to the right, um, which, um, which is consistent with the group velocity being greater than the phase velocity. All right, so you're going to play around with this uh, more in the homework. Um,
to get a little bit more intuition of how uh, the group and phase velocities um, relate to the, the parameters of the uh, individual waves that you're adding. Okay, so in the next lecture, we will look at constructing wave packets using uh, multiple waves instead of just two. So using Fourier series and Fourier transforms.